test, test. Thank you guys. Um, I think we're gonna get we're gonna get started. I know we're running uh, a little late, but that's uh, uh, normal at Arab events, so I'm not really concerned. We accounted for it. You may not know that, but the actual start times in the program are not the actual start times. That's another. Th <laughs> that's another thing our communities have in common, right? It's, it's certainly a common challenge. Uh, but prior to getting started, I want you to just take a look quickly on what you have uh, on your seat, which is one of our asks, which uh, is um, addressing the. NSA surveillance issue. Uh, you'll see here a number of steps you can take, uh, including tweeting uh, members of the U.S. Senate uh, on the importance of this issue um, and the fact that we need some transparency, we need some hearings, and you know, to really t give this issue its its due uh, worth. Uh, and um, you know, contact these senators, and the sample tweets are already there for you, so it can't get any easier than that. If you don't have any reception, ask us. We'll give you a Wi-Fi password. Hopefully, that we could. Uh, use for you to send these tweets out. Uh, but there are Senate, uh, the Senator tweets, uh, the Twitter addresses for, the Twitter handles for uh, Senators that are part of the Senate Intelligence Committee and the tweets right above them. So please review this, uh, take some action, because uh, remember as we've been saying this whole convention, uh, it does start with you. Um, so thank you for uh, joining us uh, for this session. And uh, just a real quick overview. Uh, we'll start off with a, uh, some quick introductions uh, then each of the panelists will give a you know, quick five-minute remark. Uh, then I'll ask a few questions, and then we'll open it up to the floor uh, for questions as well. We do have a very diverse panel, uh, a very strong panel. Uh, each one of these individuals is a respected leader uh, in their community and their organization. Uh, and they've, they've done a lot of work and great work for civil rights and civil liberties um, as a whole, not for any specific community, but the work they do impact all of us in this room and many others across the country as well. So I want to start uh, to my immediate right. So we, we have Mr. Uh, Reggie Shepherd, uh, who's the executive director of the ACLU uh, in Pennsylvania. Prior to joining the ACLU of Pennsylvania, he served director of law and policy uh, at Equal Justice Society, uh, a national strategy group heightening consciousness on race and the law and popular discourse. Uh, Reggie has been a longtime friend uh, of ADC and of the Arab community, working on many uh, impact litigation cases, uh, and has been done, doing great work uh, over the past year on uh, a number of cases related to voter uh, voter initiatives and so forth. Uh, next to Reggie. Yes. Thank you. Very, very, very important work. Okay. Uh, next to Reggie, we have uh, Linda Sarsour, um, whose bio states, a working woman, community activist, and mother of three. Uh, in my opinion, one of the strongest leaders we have uh, in our community. She's outspoken, she's independent, uh, and she really does the work on the ground uh, that impacts changes uh, impact policy, ch policy changes not only in New York, uh, but also. Uh, also, um, She is a pure New Yorker, born and raised in Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> and currently she is the National Advocacy Director for NAC, National Network of Arab American Communities uh, and Access. And she's locally serving as the Director of the Arab American Association uh, of New York. And has done a lot of work uh, on surveillance, particularly on the NYPD uh, issue. So her work is very timely, uh, given the news that we heard in the past week from the NSA uh, and the PRISM program, and she also is working on it from an advocacy organizing level uh, on the ground also. So thank you, Linda, for joining us. And to my immediate uh, left is Mr. Bahar Azmi, the legal director of the Center for Constitutional right, Rights. Uh, Bahar has pursued constitutional human rights litigation challenging policy emerges, emerging from the so-called uh, war on terror, including policies related to indefinite executive detention, extraordinary rendition, and torture. He's offered many briefs uh, in the Court of Appeals and the U.S. Supreme Court on various human rights and international law issues and produced substantial scholarship issues related to cases, um, on issues related to access of justice. Um, Bahar has also done, and CCR has done great work uh, on the Guantanamo cases as well as on the Abu Ghraib uh, cases, which uh, we proudly supported uh, a few weeks back. And thank you for your work as well. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll uh, get started uh, with Reggie with opening remarks. Okay. Yeah. Um, so thank you all for, for being here this afternoon. Uh, I know you just had lunch, probably full, and a nap might be really your preferred um, thing to do right now, but we're glad that you're here, that you joined us. And I, it's an honor for me to be um, here as well. Uh, my last time was 
uh, in 2002, and I was at the National ACLU at the time, and I um, was filing uh, airline profiling cases uh, around the country, and ADC was in fact a client in two of my, in two of my lawsuits. Uh, I also filed the first no-fly list case in the country in federal court in 2004. Uh, I like to say I was a man before my time because the courts weren't quite ready for it then, <laughs> um, and they summarily kicked me out of court. But uh, there's another, at least one no-fly list case going on by my colleagues at um, the National ACLU, and I hope that it meets with better success than mine did. Um, so uh, over the past um, year or so, as Brother Abed mentioned, um, I've been working uh, on voter um, suppression uh, issues uh, at the ACLU of Pennsylvania, where I'm now um, working. Um, I want to talk a little bit about that. Time is limited, but I want to give a little background before I do so. Um, so I don't know if you guys have read this book, but one of the many truly great things about Michelle Alexander's brilliant book, The New Jim Crow Mass Incarceration uh, in the Age of Colorblindness, um, are the parallels that it draws between historical and current attempt to subjugate and disenfranchise people of color, African Americans in particular. So throughout history, when African Americans have made political, um, economic, um, social progress, um, the powers that be would respond by trying to uh, create systems that would subjugate them um, and take away all the gains that they made. So there was Jim Crow uh, after the Reconstruction period and the new Jim Crow in the form of mass incarceration that followed the gains uh, of the Civil Rights Movement. Um, efforts uh, to exclude African Americans from the democratic process um, are what in fact gave rise to the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which um, as many of you know, um, is in great jeopardy <laughs> before the Supreme Court of the United States as we speak uh, in a case called Shelby County, Alabama versus Holder. Um, at issue in that case is section five, the preclearance um, provision that says that um, states or jurisdictions that are under um, the jurisdiction of the federal government because of a history of, of voter discrimination before they change anything having to do with their voter laws, they have to get it pre-cleared by the federal government. Um, and so that case was argued months ago by, by our good friends at LDF and we are waiting any day now for a decision. So just like after the success of uh, Reconstruction and the Civil Rights Movement, President Obama's election in 2008 likewise gave uh, rise to an effort to, again, contain black social and political progress. And so one of the mechanisms for doing so uh, was voter suppression. So in 2008, there was a, a record turnout among voters, particularly voters of color. So the response to that was prior to 2012, um, many states across the country electing or erecting these, um, these laws, voter suppression laws that would limit the participation of people of color from participating in the 2012 election. So following 2012, 2008, and before the 2012 elections, 13 states passed laws that resigned to end, limit, or reduce voter registration. registration. Um, 30 states in all uh, introduced voter suppression legislation. I said 13 um, passed laws related to voter registration. Another eight um, passed laws requiring voter ID, including Pennsylvania, which is where I live. Several other states, including Ohio, Georgia, Florida, and West Virginia, uh, reduced or tried to eliminate altogether um, early or absentee voting periods. So all of the, the combination of these efforts um, stood to disenfranchise some six million or more people. Um, so we didn't sit back, um, we uh, engaged in litigation and other types of community organizing efforts to fight back. In Pennsylvania, we challenged the voter ID law. We were back and forth between district court and the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania before we finally won um, just a month before um, the November elections um, by securing a preliminary injunction 
that while poll workers um, were required to ask you for your photo identification in order to vote, you weren't required to have that photo ID in order to exercise your fundamental right to vote. So, but no good deed goes undone, no civil liberties battle remains won, and so we're back in court a month from now um, to seek a permanent, as opposed to a preliminary injunction that would completely block um, the implementation of the voter ID law in Pennsylvania. I'm gonna stop right now, but one thing that I do wanna say and mention is that notwithstanding all of those efforts to lock certain people out of the political and democratic process, African Americans as a whole voted more uh, for the first time in 2012 than their white counterparts. So, um, I would say this, black folks weren't having it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Woo. So thank you uh, for having me here. Um, as Abid uh, said, uh, my name is Linda Sarswar and I came, from, came to DC all the way from New York City. Um, I want you to, to think about what I'm, what, I'm gonna, what I'm about to tell you right now and think about if, if this was you or if this was the city that you lived in. You lived in a city that was uh, your bookstores, your cafes, your mosques, your civic associations, your Arab and Muslim student associations were all surveilled by the government. Your, this very room that you're in, um, there might be two or three government informants in this very room right now. You live in a community where when you're praying at the mosque, you don't even know if the guy next to you is really there to pray or is he there to listen in on your conversations. The places where you buy groceries um, and not feeling trust, trusting enough when your children um, are going into university in hopes that they become activists and be part of SJPs and Muslim student associations and what you tell your kids every day is to be careful, to watch what they say. This is the reality of really every Arab and Muslim in America, but I'm gonna to talk to you more specifically about New York City. The New York Police Department is the largest police force in the country. It acts as a federal law enforcement agency. They have the largest counterterrorism department in the country. They have posts in Madrid, in London, in Israel, in Morocco. They have paid undercovers as well as informants people who have gotten in trouble with the law, who break deals with the government to spy on their own communities. We, all, we always knew this. We knew this post 9-11, more specifically for me, um, as a person who uh, was uh, 21 years old when 9-11 happened. And we've been saying this for 10 years. Nobody was listening to us. People said we were being victims or we were overreacting. And then in 2011, the Associated Press revealed documents that basically confirmed every single thing that our community had felt and thought was happening to us. And what it revealed was that the police department had what they called the demographics unit. And what the demographics unit did, and I believe continues to do, the New York Police Department will tell you we closed the demographics unit, but what they actually did was they just changed the name to the zone assessment unit. I mean, we're not a very naive community. And what, they, what this demographics unit did is it surveilled what they called 29 ancestries of interest. They included probably every national origin that's probably in this room right now, um, majority Arab and or Muslim countries, and they made a special designation. The number 29 was what they called black American Muslim. And people say, well, if you're not doing anything wrong, you should be okay. We don't think that's okay. We think that we have a constitution and we think that our communities deserve the same dignity and respect as any other community in this country and we do not deserve to have infringement on our privacy. So, what we want, what I, the, the story of New York, you might say, well I don't live in New York, I live in Virginia, in Texas, in California. If we can get New York straight, if I can get the New York Police Department straight, I can guarantee you we can get any police department in this country straight. And it is very important to understand the implications of spying on communities solely based on perceived faith or national origin. It is not okay. It is not okay to spy on people with no 
predicate to criminal activity, and it's not okay to spy on people who are innocent, and then to spy on them and walk away and say, actually, they were innocent. <laughs> that is not okay, it is not right, and we as a community need to stand up and say that it's not right. So, in New York City, we have organizing, we've been organizing against the New York Police Department, and we've been standing tall, standing brave. You know why? Because other communities have done that before us. And because when I look my child in the eye, I feel good about myself because I want my child to know that what I'm doing is I'm creating a society where my child is gonna grow up to know that I want them to live in a society that respects them, that embraces who they are, and does not think they are suspects or terrorists just for the simple fact of being Arab or Palestinian or Muslim. So we'll talk a little bit more later on. I think this conference, what's so important about the theme of it is that I'm not gonna change the police department all, all by myself, even though Mayor Bloomer and Commissioner Kelly think I'm their worst nightmare. But I can't do it alone, neither can my organization and neither can the community in New York on their own change the discriminatory policies of a police department that is following orders from the top. And as we saw recently in the context of NSA spying and, and all the revelations that came to you, no American has been left untouched in this country. So people will say, so what's the difference? We're all getting our phones tapped. While it's the same, it is different. Because in New York City, and in many places across the country, we are being simply targeted based on our faith, which violates equal protections. If this was happening in churches right now across the country, or in synagogues across the country, we would not be having this conversation. This government would be turned upside down. And we need to make sure that communities understand that we too are Americans, that we too have that political power and influence, and that we too deserve that dignity that is given to other communities. So we, I'm gonna end there and, and we can go back to having this discussion. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Bahar Azmi. I'm the legal director of an organization, a civil rights and human rights organization in New York called the Center for Constitutional Rights, which was founded in 1966. We talk a lot about connections. It was founded in 1966 in support of um, civil rights and freedom movements in the South. And for, you know, about the, the next um, 30 years of its existence worked on areas related to traditional civil rights and police misconduct and anti-discrimination and, and also uh, in support of women's rights and, and uh, human rights abroad. Um, and then 9-11 happened um, and CCR like the ACLU and like a lot of grassroots organizations um, mobilized uh, in response to what I think, you know, from particularly from the Arab and Muslim community, we can call a uh, legitimate human rights crisis uh, after 9-11, a crisis that was manifested in mass uh, surveillance and deportation of Arab and Muslim roundups after 9-11, uh, in the use of uh, torture uh, or extraordinary renditions of terrorist suspects, um, and I think in the sort of crown jewel of the Bush administration's counterterrorism policy, Guantanamo. Um, and so in January of 2002, soon after learning that President Bush had uh, decided to open a uh, secret, secretive um, and lawless prison facility in Guantanamo, um, which is to say, a, a prison in a location where the Bush administration um, contended no law applied whatsoever, no human rights law, no domestic civil rights, the courts would have jurisdiction, uh, the identities of the detainees there would remain private, um, a, a, you know, a sort of uh, um, Caribbean uh, gulag um, on, on Cuban soil. Uh, so uh, CCR at that point, filed uh, a challenge to the executive's authority to hold people without charge or trial, uh, without access to lawyers at a time when um, no one else would touch that kind of an issue because it was presumed, as the president had reassured everyone, these are all the worst of the worst. They're all terrorist hardened killers. They're responsible for 9-11. Um, and with the veil of secrecy around these kinds of detentions, no one 
um, was interested or even able to challenge that premise. But for the, I think, the, for skeptics um, of government power and government claims of authority, um, wanted to test that, uh, that assertion um, and ensure, as due process requires, that anyone who's being held in detention uh, deserves access to a lawyer, access to, to a court, and to, to justice. Um, the cases were, at least in the early years, thought virtually frivolous and thrown out of the lower courts um, until 2001, the Supreme Court um, uh, ruled that detainees, in, in one of our cases, had the right to challenge their detention. Um, and something sort of uh, uh, dram dramatic has, has happened over the years. I mean, I think in the early years of the existence of Guantanamo, it was genuinely thought of as, as a, like an exceptional kind of institution. It was outside of American traditions and American norms and um, uh, an aberration, um, a, uh, an, 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 an affront to the sort of American way of, of life. And in fact, the litigation strategy in the early years was not a strategy so much grounded in the human rights of individuals. It was in this really precarious time an appeal to the rule of law and American values and, and arguing that we need to sort of come back to American legal principles of, of due, due process. Um, and, but still it was, a, as in any struggle against uh, government authority, uh, the initial successes were met with massive government response and retrenchment. Um, but I think momentum from 2004 to 2008 was such that both presidential candidates claimed that they wanted to close Guantanamo, that it was, in fact, an aberration in, uh, of American values. Remember Pres how eloquently candidate and uh, Obama talked about the problems with an institution like Guantanamo. And yet again, we won an, a, another victory in the Supreme Court of 2008, and this was the combination of uh, the second Supreme Court victory guaranteeing a constitutional right to challenge detention, plus the election of President Obama, we sort of assumed that Guantanamo would meet its end. Um, and uh, it hasn't. And in fact, it's sort of been transformed from, I think, an exceptional institution to one that's been normalized in American law and public life. Um, on its own as an institution in Guantanamo, an institution where we continue to detain individuals without charge and trial, 166 now for 12 years, um, and with all sorts of uh, ripple effects throughout American domestic legal and political life. Um, it's been normalized insofar as, despite his early promises, and the Obama administration has defended practically every single practice of the Bush administration with respect to Guantanamo. Um, uh, I think conditions had improved for a little while, and we'll talk about that in a second when we talk about the, the hunger strike. Um, but in all other regards, defended the idea that you can hold individuals indefinitely without charge or trial. Um, and has, has maintained uh, uh, Guantanamo. And, and in some ways, there's been deepening and, and spreading of the, the Guantanamo paradigm. He's used the authority to create Guantanamo to provide himself the authority to undertake um, drone strikes um, anywhere where the pre president believes there's a battlefield, including in places like Yemen and pa Pakistan, and authority to, to kill even U.S. citizens, um, and we represent, along with the ACLU uh, National Office, three United States citizens who were killed by U.S. drone strikes. Same sort of paradigm, legal paradigm. Um, and then domestic ripple effects, the, the Guantanamo effect sort of seeps into um, the, the uh, sur surveillance by federal entities and, and the NYPD, dramatic sort of ratcheting up of law enforcement and kind of preventative policing practices after 9-11. Um, it's not only the largest police force in the country, as Bl Bloomberg boast, uh, boasted, we have the seventh largest army in the world. Notice the, the military metaphor. Um, and what do you do with an army? You use it. Mm -hmm. um, and so there has been this sort of retrenchment, um, as there often is in the context of civil rights battles. And that raises the question about what to do 
about the retrenchment. And one of the lessons I've taken from my sort of 10 or 12 year involvement in this post 9-11 human rights crisis is about the limits of the law in responding. The limits of, we won twice in the Supreme Court. How many issues, in how many contexts do you win twice in the Supreme Court within four years? Um, but it had little effect. Um, and, and what everyone is talking about here in terms of connections, building connections with other movements to demand from political actors really meaningful change outside mm -hmm. of the courts on the ground. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Reggie, I, I just had a follow-up question. Um, you know, oftentimes you hear of the, the, these bills coming up on the state level to uh, limit voter rights. And oftentimes it's comical. I feel like I'm reading The Onion or something. It's a little <laughs> satire, but, but these are real challenges. Um, but but how, how real are they? And how many other states are, are trying to follow what Pennsylvania was attempting to do? And how important is it uh, for organizations to organize to prevent this from happening? Yeah, um, it's very common, right? Um, you know, I think at some level there, there's a war for the future of our country. And there's some who are inclined to, to relive the good old days and to keep things as they imagined they used to be. But really, were there ever the good old days for anybody? Mm -hmm. um, versus those who want to um, sort of recognize the diversity and multiculturalism of our society. And so I think people are afraid. And so when they get afraid, they strike out. And so at uh, legislatures, in 30 states around the country, they've done some, made some effort to try to legislate um, to prevent um, folks from exercising their right to vote. And they're targeting the people who they don't want to vote, right? They don't want the people who, and, and you know, the ACLU is a nonpartisan or organization, but you have to speak the truth. They don't want those same people, well, certainly for 2012. They did not want the same people who came out in droves, um, much, a much more sort of diverse contingent of voters ever than ever in history to come back out and do the same thing in 2012. So they're taking this seriously. And they, it's really sort of the modern day version of literacy tests and poll taxes. Thank you. Um, and you know, my follow-up question for you, uh, you know, the, the importance, many will look at what's happening in NYPD as a, a legal issue, but I think it's it's more so than that, and it's also probably a, a good exercise in community organizing. And um, a, a lot of the work you've done, could, if you could talk about the importance of community organizing, particularly around the stop and frisk program, which you guys have done great work on, and you know how important it is to work and, and the experiences you've had uh, on that end. So the NYPD didn't just start targeting the Muslim community, um, you know, in post 9-11 and before that, they were like this perfect police department. Um, they've been a racist police department probably ever since their inception. Um, and their policies are so permeated um, in their system. And it's not to say that the entire police force is a bad police force. There are plenty of wonderful police officers who work for the NYPD, wonderful Arab and Muslim and African American and Latinos, a very diverse police force. But uh, these, these wonderful people who are serving in our communities um, not all of them, but many of them who are, have no power um, in changing the system um, within the police department. So when the AP revealed that the uh, NYPD was doing this blanket surveillance of the Muslim community, we thought to ourselves, we're not gonna win this alone. We can't do this by ourselves. So what we did was is we joined forces with those that were doing work against stop and frisk. Stop and frisk is a policy that basically stops every black and Latino kid um, wearing a book bag, um, walking on a particular you know, neighborhood. Um, in 2011, the New York Police Department stopped 685,000 young blacks and Latinos. That's more than the young and blacks and Latinos that we have in New York City, um, which means that young people were stopped multiple times. Um, so the folks doing police reform work around stop and frisk, it just makes so much sense because they're like, don't target us because we're black and because we're Latino. And then we're like, don't target us because we're Muslim or because you think we're Muslim. A lot of our, uh, Arab Christians got involved, right? Because some of the businesses that were surveilled, <laughs> when the, you should read these documents, ap.org slash NYPD, you would really laugh. For example, when they were mapping the businesses, they would say, for example, Salam restaurant owned by Syrian 
Sun means, right? They, they, would, they would literally, it, it literally says that. The funny thing is this particular restaurant in Bay Ridge um, is actually owned by Lebanese Shia. And I actually told the NYPD once, I was like, do you understand when you tell a Lebanese that they're Syrian, do you understand the controversy that that creates and vice versa? Um, so the, the fact that the, the documents aren't even accurate is the point I'm trying to make here. Um, and the work around stop and frisk and surveillance has really bought this huge diverse coalition of people that are saying, listen, enough is enough. Stop discriminatory policies in the New York Police Department. It's not, I mean, I've asked for the resignation of Commissioner Kelly, who's our police commissioner. But is it really gonna stop with Commissioner Kelly if he says, you know what, Linda, I'm gonna step down, I'm tired of this, I'm gonna get out of here. It's not. It's the policies within the police department. We've been doing organizing work. There was a, there was a, a lawsuit that's been filed by the Center for Constitutional Rights. It's the Floyd versus the city of New York. Brave, young, African-American, Latino men have stepped up on behalf of all young uh, African-American and Latino men to sue the city of New York. And in that, in that courtroom, there were days where you saw all Arabs and Muslims in that courtroom. There were days where you saw only women. There was days where you saw LGBTQ. You, there were days where you saw the Asian community. Why? Because we wanted these lawsuits to not just be about a lawsuit, because it's not legal. It's about showing power and what's behind and the movements behind these lawsuits. I don't have a lot of confidence in our justice system. So do I think that lawsuits are the way to get our justice? That's, that's not what I think. I think it's a potential venue to do it, but the organizing work is important. But fear is a big thing in our community. People are afraid. People are, give you many examples of why they should be afraid, and you know what? It's very valid. And then four years, I had this one last conversation with my mom, because my mom was like, Linda, you have to be careful. You know, you know in Arabic, you know, we don't know. Look what happened to this one and that one. And I told my mom, if every single person before us was careful <coughs> and didn't do this work, you wouldn't be in this country right now. We wouldn't be able to live the life that we live right now. So I told my mom that that was the last day that she was gonna tell me to be careful. <laughs> and since that day, that was over four years ago, my mom has never said that again. And I think that the idea here is to think about that. If we and all of you in this room are careful, the times are just gonna get worse. And for your children and your grandchildren, you are doing a disservice to them. So all of us have to not be careful. We have to speak truth to power, take risks on the issues that we're working on. And you know what? Something really bad and terrible might happen to me or anyone else, and you know what? It's okay. Because none of, nothing bad will happen to any of us in vain because we're doing the right thing, not just by our own community, not just by the Arab community or the Muslim community, but all communities that we represent um, here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Here, I have, I have two questions for you uh, from your work, um, and, and one of them, you know, pertaining to the, the drones and surveillance, and, you know, has this country uh, defined a fine line between, you know, the en enemy combatant and U.S. citizen and, you know, who's actually targeted uh, by the, not only the use of domestic drones, but foreign drones, and also the second part of the question you kind of alluded to in your statements by Obama's um, continuous use of the Bush-era uh, policies. Uh, is he any better um, than, you know, I know it's a vague question, but, you know, is this administration any better than what we've seen in the eight years uh, with, with George Bush, or are we seeing the same continuous use of policies uh, impacting our communities and stripping of our, you know, civil rights and liberties? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think for, for progressives, Obama in some ways feels better because um, he, you know, to take his last speech on national security around drones in Guantanamo, he, he made sort of nods to sentiments that would suggest, um, you know, people like, like us maybe ag agree that his heart is in the right place. But consistently, in terms of his actions, um, he has not made any kind of fundamental departure from the Bush administration with respect to drone policy, has escalated it dramatically, and, and has done so um, I mean, there's, there's, there's it's a little bit of um, Linda's point about the role of, for example, Commissioner Kelly in the NY Police Department. Um, th th there is, you know, ongoing this sort of global war paradigm that bridges both administrations that currently sees, you know, the entire world as a battlefield with some constraints. Um, and it's that paradigm that 
created Guantanamo and maintains Guantanamo, and that also permits us to, to um, uh, use drone strikes um, in places outside conventional battle, battlefields, which, which might be, for example, Afghanistan. We use them in Yemen. Um, and so, and, and at the same time, is given these sort of policies of, of veneer of legality um, and, and normalization, which is what, what is, I think, particularly dangerous. And given that they are, in the, in the sort of court sense, legal, you think hard about what to do about that. And, and maybe I can bring this back to, to uh, Guantanamo for a second again. I mentioned there are 166 men still detained there. None have really been transferred since 2011 out, out of Guantanamo. Um, 86 have been cleared for transfer by the Obama administration. That is to say, a unanimous panel of agencies, relevant agencies, State Department, CIA, National Security, Defense Department, has determined that these 86 individuals need no longer be held. They're not a threat to national security, yet they remain. And, and something, and, and so as lawyers have been working on these issues for a long time, the courts had stopped caring about uh, the men in Guantanamo. The, the Obama administration had stopped caring about the men in Guantanamo. And so we as lawyers felt powerless, but something happened that reminded us, and we've all been talking about this, about uh, you know, lessons about how social change happens. And, and um, so we could not get any attention to the, pl the plight of detainees until in February, detainees themselves started a hunger strike. Um, and uh, hunger st they were on a hunger strike that increased and increased and increased in solidarity. It started from an incident related to the disrespect of the Quran, but moved into genuine protest about their indefinite detention. And three months into that, finally, a reporter asked, asked President Obama a question about Obama, uh, Guantanamo. He hadn't addressed it in three years. And he said, we have to recommit to closing Guantanamo. I'm going to take action. Now, I'm not sure he's going to. I think, I think there will be some on the margins. And the next week, he gave a speech. It wasn't the lawyers filing claims in court. It is, as it always is, I think, those who are suffering or who are oppressed who need to stand up because they can best sort of articulate what's happening to them. And that brings us to, you know, uh, uh, Linda and Reggie's point about organizing and, and making sure that um, we are political and we express ourselves and we stand up to, to power structures and don't expect either grace from politicians or heroic lawyers, you know, the, the next Thurgood Marshall to sweep down and, and get a, a, a pronouncement from a court of law um, uh, changing things. Um, and I, I think there are these consistent themes that go to political a, you know, activism, motivation, um, and, and not, not being safe on these questions. Well, Reggie, just a follow-up question off that. I mean, how's the administration been on the, uh, the voting uh, issue? <laughs> and are we seeing a difference between you know, national security stances from the Obama administration as compared to some of the domestic, um, you know, it's like, yeah. you know, I mean, from my perspective, they've they've been great <laughs> on the right. voting issues because they're self-interested, exactly. right? right? I mean, they want to be elected and they don't right. want anything to stand in the way of that, and so they show up, right? They say the right things, they do the right things. I'm not sure I blame them. I mean, I wish they were as great on all these other issues, mm -hmm. but I appreciate that they're really good on the voting stuff. I have to admit to that. And Linda, how about on the um, uh, NYPD issue? I know there was an article the other day, maybe that the DOJ may provide some some oversight, but that's not the final answer on that uh, on that issue. But how, how have they been on the issue? They've been terrible. This administration has been terrible. The only thing that ever happened, the oversight that uh, Abbott's talking about is that the DOJ finally uh, said, stop and frisk, we might want to monitor that policy. So stop and frisk obviously is not the same as NYPD surveillance. But the administration ha has ignored us. We have asked for uh, Attorney General Holder to do an investigation. We had gotten like a response from him that said something like, sounds a little concerning. That just means that he opened our letter and read it probably, but that's as far as that went. Our mayor unequivocally supports the program. Um, our governor supports it. Our state attorney general has not investigated it. Um, many politicians support it. Uh, it's, we really have been um, fighting a really hard fight. 
Um, and I think it's because maybe we haven't been fighting the fight long enough. And I think on stop and frisk, for example, there are much more or many more people that are more likely to say it's very bad and racist to stop black and Latinos than they are to say stop spying um, on Muslims. And I think the issue here also about, um, about the spying program that makes it different than stop and frisk is that it's not, they don't think it's an inconvenience because for stop and frisk, the police officer has to stop you, frisk you, whatever. But with spying, it's like you're just going on with your daily life. Like no one, you know, you don't even know if you're being <laughs> spied on as if that's okay. Um, and I think that that's the other issue. And the other issue is that the way that it's framed by our police department and by our mayor and by most often some of the media is that it's about personal security. So people ask themselves the question, so if I want to be safe and I don't want another 9-11 to happen in New York, it's a little okay to violate the civil rights of a couple of people so that I can stay safe. And people think that that's okay, it makes them feel better. Um, and I think that's the issue that we're dealing with. We're trying to reframe the conversation that people should be up at, by the way, when the NSA thing was happening, I was like, I was calling out everybody. Because I was like, oh, now you're upset. But when it was happening, when you thought it was only happening to the Muslims, then you were cool with it. But now that every American's phone is being tapped, and that every you know, phone company is getting, ask, being asked for their phone records, suddenly everyone's up in arms. And that's the problem here. It's about how do we reframe this dis discussion so that when a young black kid in New York is shot, an innocent young black boy in New York is shot by a NYPD officer, and even if he wasn't innocent, he shouldn't be getting shot by anyone. But when many innocent young men are being shot by the, by the police, everybody should be up in arms about that. Just like when our young Muslim men are being entrapped by law enforcement agencies and being put in solitary confinement, for doing nothing wrong, but following a paid informant by law enforcement, we should all be up in arms about that. Um, and we should be up in arms that there are innocent people in Guantanamo Bay that have been cleared of all charges and are still hanging out in Guantanamo Bay. It shouldn't just be Arabs and Muslims and Pakistanis and Yemenis that are up in arms. It should be all of us. And I think that's how do we get to a situation or how do we get to the place together where every American's up in arms on these civil rights violations. And that's the issue that I grapple with every day. And I think, but it seems to me like that, because of these coalitions that we now realize we have to be a part of, because even as lawyers, some of us, you know, we don't have faith that the court system is gonna get it right all the time. They get it wrong a lot. And so if you're not gonna be victorious in court, where are you gonna see your victories happen? On the ground, in the legislature, I'm not sure about the legislature. But the bottom line is we recognize that particularly with limited resources, we have to work together. Absolutely. And so if we're working together now on stop and frisk or Guantanamo or NSA spying, right? Then tomorrow, or voting rights or whatever, tomorrow we'll be working together again on whatever the next issue is. And Absolutely. I think these coalitions really benefit us today on whatever our present work is but we need to make sure that we keep those coalitions alive and well and thriving so that we can call upon them again whenever the next issue, which you can count on, is gonna happen, happens. Can I just add one quick thing? Um, you know, a lot of times people also say, and, and sometimes our government, actually not sometimes, all the time, the government finds some sort of law that, that basically protects what they've done. So they'll say, us, unconstitutional? Nope, we're following this law or that law. And I always remind people, that just because something is law doesn't make it right or make it moral. And that's, that's something that we don't, I mean, slavery was like, like we were, we, we own, people were property in this country and that was okay and it was legal to do that. So I also want people to think about in a challenging manner when, they, when our government you know, reauthorizes the Patriot Act, right? That, that basically says it's okay to spy on people. That's just because it's law, it's not right, right? And then, on, and then what's funny is that after this NSA um, expose, the Republicans were up in arms because, you know, they don't want big government and they're all like, so, you know, the, all the libertarians are like, oh. I was like, uh, let's take out the uh, registry here and see you reauthorize the Patriarch. That's your name right there. That's not my name. And then now all of a sudden after they reauthorize these laws, then they're mad about it like yesterday. And I'm like, really? Like, and it's back to the whole like, are we running an onion government? And sometimes like I laugh all the time. I'm like, <laughs> you said that that was okay because you signed to reauthorize the Patriot Act. The Patriot Act is, allows these things to happen. So if someone tells you this is the law, and if you believe it's not right, it's not a moral law, then we need to fight to change those laws. And, and that's why we are living live in the United States of America, we don't live in Saudi Arabia. That's the issue that I'm trying to get across to people that 
We don't, we don't live in a, we didn't come to this country to be obedient. We came here because there's a democracy and we need to be a part of that democracy. We need to push back too, right? We need to push back. Just because something is the way that it is, because it's the way that it is, hello? Do we need to accept that? And like Linda said, just because something is a law, do we need to make, let it stay the law? This voter ID stuff was gonna be the law until we push back. Mm -hmm. Separate but equal was the law until we push back. I mean like, hell no. Yep. Oh, so here, I don't know if you wanted to chime in. I mean, I, I, think, I think we're all pretty much on the same page here in terms of um, recognizing that um, power requires, that, that institutions of power require, um, you know, consistent challenge um, because even, even a little bit of progress invites retrenchment in voting rights and national security <coughs> policy. And the only way to manage that kind of uh, challenge sustainably is to build coalitions among people um, where litigation is just one um, tool, really a, a, a tool that's used most effectively insofar as it gets people in a courtroom talking, you know, t telling um, the court, the judge, the public, the defendant, the NYPD, we're here, we're watching you. Um, and uh, because, you know, law is ultimately about power um, and can change law only through power. Um, Thank you. Um, before we get into question and answer, I just wanted to give just a few updates, um, you know, from ADC's end. In, in the past calendar year, the organization received, you know, a little over a thousand uh, inquiries and complaints. Uh, number one uh, issue uh, was uh, immigration related matters followed closely by employment discrimination, employment related matters, which take up you know a bulk of the uh, cases and takes the work on. Now again, not every case uh, is a serious one. Uh, sometimes we get calls that uh, you know don't pan out uh, after investigation. Uh, regardless, one case is one too many. Uh, we also had, a, a, as mentioned during the luncheon, we've also seen a change to the. Uh, FBI hate, hate crimes tracking form, uh, which was brought forward by a strong coalition uh, with the Sikh community and the Native American community. Uh, and that should be implemented uh, in a year and a half. Uh, yet despite these changes and despite some of these uh, gains, there's still a lot of work uh, to be done, uh, particularly from our end, from the community's end. And one of the problems we often see uh, is underreporting uh, of issues. So, you know, we urge you that when you go back to your communities that you, Bring forward any cases. Don't be shy. Don't be afraid, as Linda said, to come forward if there's a case or if there's something going on or something happens on the job. You have rights. You, you, you need to exercise these rights. You need to come forward, make a complaint, see an attorney. If it's not ADC, call any local organization. But just make sure your, your voice is heard. Don't just sit back uh, and take it if something is happening to you. Uh, so, you know, during the question and answer, feel free, uh, you know, to ask uh, uh, quick and poignant questions. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, so I want to make sure that we can get in uh, as many questions as we have. Marwa, could you um, grab the mic? Uh, please try to keep your questions to about 30 seconds or so, and we'll try to keep our answers between uh, a minute or so. And if you have any questions pertaining to ADC projects or initiatives, please feel free um, to ask me as well. Again, please keep your questions short. Um, if we wanted longer questions or statements, we would have uh, had you on the panel. <laughs> uh, but uh, so let's give an opportunity to hear from our panelists and continue the uh, conversation further. Uh, the microphone for question and answer uh, will be right there. So if you want to line up uh, for any questions, that's okay. Go ahead. Can you guys sorry, mm -hmm. can you guys hear him or <laughs> no, Marwa? Or someone could use the microphone. Pull the microphone. All right. Up. He turned it on now, uh, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, so. uh, Obama has made a point of blaming Congress for the fact that Guantanamo mm -hmm. is still open. However, it's my understanding that he has the authority that Congress allowed him uh, on a case-by-case -case basis to uh, release those mm -hmm. people. Sure is does. that the fact, and why has he uh, not exercised that authority? Right. Um, yeah, that's a, the, the question is, you know, who's to blame for the current state of affairs in Guantanamo? Obama likes to blame Congress, and um, don't get me wrong, Congress has been 
you know, the most venal institution imaginable when it comes to uh, detainees, just absolutely reprehensible um, and imposed obstacles on President Obama. They never bothered to on President Bush. Um, grandstanding, inflammatory rhetoric about uh, detainees and, and Obama being soft on terror. Um, and, and more concretely, they've um, imposed some restrictions about the money he can use to transfer detainees. Um, but it, that is ultimately just it. It's a, an obstacle which he has full authority to overcome. Um, he can transfer any detainee if he certifies that he's made sort of due diligence to ensure that when the person is returned, uh, they won't pose a risk to national security or that it's in the interest of national security to, to, to return someone, which is kind of the identical consideration um, he and the, his predecessor were making anyway. It's not like they're returning people willy-nilly. They're, they're going through a process to ensure that they'll return to family and that they'll have government support, all of that. So basically what he's announced is what people have been telling him for these the past few years. Yeah. Just do it. You have all the authority you need. Um, and he's to blame. Um, I, we, uh, that's our position. We blame him, um, not, not, not Congress. But why is he refusing to exercise <coughs> the power he has? Oh, I think he has no interest in taking a political risk. And until the hunger strike, nobody give, uh, gave a damn. Now, when people start dying in Guantanamo, and, and, and he owns it as much as President Bush, maybe when he gets close to that point, our, the Nobel laureate, um, he'll, do, he'll do something about it. Uh, but it's just, a, 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 what we've been saying all along, a failure of will. It's not a failure of power. And, 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 and he responds to, you know, he will use his will if we make him. Anything? Well, we want to go to the next question. L Linda made an interesting point that nobody really cared when the Arabs and Muslims were being watched, but once everybody's being watched, there's a bit more concern. But even so, I think the polls show that there's a majority who said, oh, well, that's probably necessary. And we know that earlier we did, there was a speaker who said only three out of 10 million was the chance of something happening to you. So my question, which may be beyond the panel, is how do you deal with this irrational fear that makes it possible for people to put up with this? I mean, it's, surveillance as such is not a like, like overt practice. So people are like, I'm still working, I'm still you know, going to the movies, I'm still hanging out with my friends, you know, I'm still hanging out in my house. So like, it's, easy, it's something easy to forget that is happening to you um, versus, um, you know, something more like, a, you know, something like stop and frisk, for example, um, which is, a, again, a more covert type of um, law enforcement practice. And it's really about, you know, all everyone in this room being outraged and trying to make other people outraged. What it is, the, what, the way I, li I like to think about organizing around justice and social justice is there's three things um, we need to do. We need to agitate we need to legislate and we need to litigate. Um, those, are the, those are my three avenues. Um, and I think that right away, the minute that the program came out, bam, ACLU is like suing the, go you know, the government. Two for days later. Two <laughs> days later, you know. And, and I think that people in our community are not well informed. And then the other thing also is I feel like a lot of people, especially a lot of the newer immigrants, like, you know, we come from countries where surveillance is very normal. Where we don't, where we're not able to speak up against our government. Like in Jordan, my dad's always like, you're not allowed to go to Jordan. I'm like, you know, he's like, you just don't know how to, you know, <laughs> keep quiet. Um, and, you know, we come from countries, you know, we have Mossad, Mossad we have Mukhabarat, and that's the kind of language, that's normal, right? It's normal. So we, go, we come from other countries where this has been normalized. The idea here is it's not normal. This is not normal. And I think that it's very hard. I don't know, I, to tell you the truth, I don't know how I can create, I wish I can create a revolution. Like, we need an American revolution, number two, 2.0. Um, if I knew how to ignite that, I'd, I'd travel to every state in this country um, and, and do that. And I think that might sound too extreme, but I think it just starts with our, with our colleagues, with our families. Um, when I go home every day, I talk to my kids every day about what I do and why this is important and why they should care about certain things. And they're not going to care about everything that I care about, but at least they're informed. And I think that's the only thing that um, we can do. And, you know, and I would add that I, I really do care, I guess, what the <laughs> American public thinks about these issues. 
But on the other hand, I see us as leaders who have, based on principle, we have to do the work that we're doing. Mm -hmm. If there were three other people in the whole world who believed what we did and supported us, I mean, that's three people that's better than none. But I think in time, people will look back and say, you did the right thing back when no one else was doing it. I think principle dictates that we do stuff, even if the, the world and our colleagues or our, our neighbors haven't caught up with us yet. I'm hoping in time they will catch up with us. But even absent that, I feel we have no choice but to do the work that we have to do. You know, and, and there was one interesting th statistic which came out the other day that showed more Republicans and independents showed concern uh, of the NSA and the surveillance than Democrats, which is a, a telltale sign of what you were talking about earlier of the easing into Obama mm -hmm. uh, and his policies as yeah, well. People are much more willing to forgive him yeah. as well. I think people, tr they trust that he's gonna yeah. do the right thing, yeah. that he's gonna be less of a, a renegade, less of a maverick. You know, they've, a lot of people voted for him and they're just <laughs> willing to give him the, the benefit of the yeah. doubt, but it's scary, right? Because if these same policies and practices exist when he's out of office, then the next person, whoever that is, could do the same thing and they could do it much more nefariously, if you will. Thank you as uh, activists and lawyers, uh, you are defending uh, our rights, our, our con constitution and our uh, United States of America, uh, the great government, uh, world leaders, leader. <laughs> and we are proud of it to be a world leader and we are proud we're here and we are proud of our constitution. We dislike who disregard the <laughs> constitution. Could, could we get to actually. the question please as well? Mm -hmm. And we also, we also uh, we uh, as Arab American, we feel that uh, we are monitored and listened to. I feel that every time, I even I, I call to my sister, she's not a politician, she's not a, an activist and uh, why, I mean, why we have to be listened to even in little talks, in little questions, how are you doing, uh, what are you doing, how is your kids, uh, this could, thing, this kind of thing. Could we get to the thing. question? Is, 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 is this is, is my question. Yeah, yeah. Why, why is the surveillance? The, even yeah, as small why the, the, uh, also the burden comes to us when uh, the American politicians send, uh, send uh, uh, airplanes to attack another countries other countries, well, let's, let's just and we are <laughs> Arab, Arab people have to uh, care to carry the burdens. <laughs> Can we get to the? Uh, Let me. This is. Thank you. Okay, I think we got the question. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna answer the the. <laughs> The first part of the question is about like you know why would the government even care about like you know I'm calling you up to ask you about like I don't know where do you want to go drink coffee after this right. Um, what I'd like people to do is online. There is a report called. Um, radicalization in the West, the homegrown threat. It's a 99 page document, but it's a fascinating read for anyone who's interested in understanding surveillance programs. So in that, in that 99 page document, which was not supposed to be public, it's also an NYPD document, basically the analyst who wrote that uh, report said that, these are the things that we believe lead to potential terrorism. So they say things like, someone who becomes a more devout Muslim. So if you start praying more, or you start going to frequenting mosque, I, I'm, I'm not kidding, like read the report, I promise you that's what it says. It says things like when, young, when a young man stops wearing hip hop clothing, when they, people stop smoking, drinking alcohol, uh, some of the terror hotspots are taxi depots where New York City taxi cab drivers park their taxis at night. Um, so I want you to think about that because it's every, that's, that's normal everyday things that for example like Muslim people do. They pray, they go to mosque, they grow beards, they you know, don't drink alcohol. I mean, <laughs> so the government is basically taking normal things that Muslims do and the funny thing is is that people will say, well yeah, I'm not Muslim, I'm Christian. They don't know the difference. Um, that's the other problem. So I would worry, it doesn't matter. But the, the issue here is that the most simplest things that people do, sit at bookstores, go to Islamic bookstores, hang out at hookah shops, watch Al Jazeera. There are coffee shops now. In the NYPD documents, it, they reported, um, you know, Nina Coffee House, 
Al Jazeera was the channel that's being watched in that. Uh, every Arab watches Al Jazeera. Like if that's the predicate to potential terrorism, then we should all be worried about the very simple things that we do. But on the other point about, you know, our country goes to war with Muslim countries and, and are, are intervening in Arab conflicts, this is what I always tell people. If you can't get our community straight, if you can't fight for your rights in the United States of America as an American, then you can't do nothing for your sisters and brothers in Palestine or in Syria, <laughs> Lebanon, in Pakistan. And in order for us to influence what's happening in the Middle East, it's about in influencing foreign policy of the US government. And the way that you do that is by putting people in office that represent your values and people that agree with you. And right now, there's a lot of people out there that don't agree with you, and that's why we've been in a 64-year conflict in Palestine because we haven't found the right leadership in, in Congress. You know what? Half of you should be in Congress. Like, why isn't that we have more Arab Americans in Congress, more Muslim Americans in Congress, more Pakistanis and others who have the special interest in making it right in the other part of the world? So let's get it right here. Let's get our, restore our rights here. Let's uphold our constitution for us here in our own country. And then let's go worry about what's happening on the other side of the world because we are failing our sisters and brothers and we should be ashamed of ourselves that we're failing our sisters and brothers because we have failed our own communities here in the United States. Sorry, uh, no, I know, but you had your, your opportunity to question. Um, I applaud everything you're doing, and I'm not a lawyer. I'm an art therapist, so I look at things from a psychological point of view. And I don't know, are you familiar with the uh, fear.org? Uh, fear Inc. Fear Inc. Mm -hmm. org. If, if you're not, Google it because it exposes an actual campaign that's funded by the Koch brothers to actually uh, create fear in the American mind against Muslims and Arabs, which is the other side of what you're talking about because we have the fear in our community of speaking out, but there's sort of the fear of the average American of <gasps> these terrorists. And, and I think that is what needs also to be exposed and to, to look at both how fear really pushes. So uh, do you see that as part of the coalition agenda mm -hmm. of looking, because we don't, as a population, look at the psychological aspects of our issues. And I would really encourage you all and us all to look at what drives people psychologically to, you know, circle the wagons and then, you know, react. That report that she's um, talking about is Fear Inc. Definitely pick it up. Um, basically what it does, it exposes uh, uh, the hate mongers and Islamophobes who are basically demonizing and slandering our community. They're making money off of it. Um, this report exposes $42 million. I would, I, I can bet you, another 42 million, that there's probably another 242 million dollars out there that's supporting this network. And the scariest part about this in connection to the law enforcement and all the stuff that you're hearing up on the stage is that those same people who are the Islamophobes and the ones that are creating and instilling fear and misinformation, misconceptions about us, are the same people that train our law enforcement. They're the same people that create the PowerPoint presentations for our military and they're the same people that are the pundits and the experts on CNN and MSNBC. And that's why they scare me, not because they're, uh, they're smarter than us or because they have more information than us, it's because they're given those platforms and they have the funding and the resources behind them. And that's why it's important for our community who has the same money, if not more money, to fund the opposition to that hate and create the right information, the accurate information, and to fund the work that many of our organizations are doing, but also to uh, invest in the communities of where you are and where you live to make sure that we're drowning, drowning out those haters because they are the problem and they have the money to back up their hate. Uh, right here, I don't know if you wanted to. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, 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 I, no. Think, I think that's, that's the, I mean, I think the fear is a central part of the American political psyche. I mean, this uh, famous historian wrote a book in the 40s called The Paranoid Style in American Politics. Mm -hmm. and can trace this from you know McCarthy to um, fear of Black Panthers and and you know consistent repression of minority groups, immigrants, xenophobia. Fear is a critical part of uh, um, uh, American and other cultures. It's um, and um, and the the you know one key is when the 
have suggested is um, to prevent the the um, translation of that fear into you know policy mechanisms. We may not be able to control sort of uh, some basic intuitions about the average person. That might that'll change over time. Um, but when people are able to trans you know generate fear in order to get you know. Um, uh, political rewards or financial rewards, that's when it has a real consequence. Yes, yes. Uh, I know, yeah, and I want to... Um, yeah, Dr. Seuss writes about it. I mean, it's pretty elementary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was also the, um, uh, I think a question came up, and I'll, I'll give Reggie a chance, um, about the no-fly, uh, and I think that's what you were alluding to, which is, which is a major issue we've been dealing with. And I don't know if that's something you've worked with in the past or familiar with, the no-fly cases. Yeah, yeah, no, I bought the first yeah, one so in the country and, and lost it. And that's um, so <laughs> but um, I, I didn't understand that to be your question. I'm sorry. I don't. It, I can speak in very general terms yes. um, because I didn't hear that part of your mm -hmm. question. And my answer is that it is there's ongoing litigation challenging the no-fly list. So if you're on the no-fly list or know someone who's on the no-fly list, you should contact the national ACLU in New York City, mm -hmm. they're representing people challenging it as we speak. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my question is kind of simple, hopefully. <laughs> and um, I think you have a few dozen people here, and I think one of the problems we have as Arab Americans, we do a lot of talking, but not a lot of action. So uh, my question for the panel is, what do you want us, all, I don't know, 100 people that are here, to do as soon as we walk out the door today? You want to go down the line? Sure. I would like for you to join and financially support organizations that can be helpful to you and your friends and your colleagues because none of us are independently funded and financed and we need financial support. We also need numbers, like if we are lobbying a legislator, we can say we have XYZ constituent that we represent that tend to listen to those who have the most. Um, and I think you should be having these conversations with, with people that you meet or engage with, be it on Facebook or any other medium. Um, so, I mean, I think it does start with every single person in this room, and I challenge each of us to continue this dialogue and this conversation, even if it's not particularly convenient or popular to do so. Um, I would first make a commitment before you do anything else to yourself about what the issue is that you care about. I don't think everyone cares about what I care about, so find something that you care about and make a commitment to it, a commitment to be a part of it. And the second thing is you have to stay connected because you won't know what's happening if you're not connected. So whether that means that you're connected to ABC, whether that means you're connected to another organization in your um, area that's doing this work, everyone has a mailing list, everyone has a Facebook page. Um, Neda follows me on Twitter. Twitter, I'm always asking you to do things. I'm always telling you all the up-to-date information that I have on all these issues that we talked about today. Um, so follow me on Twitter, at Elsarsour is my name. Um, and there is plenty of opportunity to sign petitions to come to rallies. Um, and if you're a New Yorker, on Tuesday at 11 o'clock in front of One Police Plaza, the Muslim community in New York City has a major announcement. And it's gonna be history in the making. You all heard about it here today. And if you follow me on Twitter, you will know what that major announcement is. Um, on Tuesday at 11 o'clock um, in New York City. So stay connected, uh, find something that you care about, and make a personal commitment to yourself um, and to the people who are impacted by that issue to make that change. So it's more internal than it is more external. Uh, I, I, I agree with all those uh, points. I mean, I think, um, so for example, if you're, issues, if you're interested in issues related to uh, war on terror, can visit our organization's website, ccrjustice.org, um, and there are special places where you can get information, take action with recommendations for petitions to sign, uh, events to attend. Um, and I think through any and all of us, stay connected in that way um, and, and spread the word. We need to build a movement that way. It's a good question, though. Yeah. Thanks for asking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, and, and, and if there's the one thing I can say on, on ADC's behalf, it's to understand the different uh, narratives and, and to uh, really understand the time that we may disagree on issues, but at the same time, there's a lot that we can work together on. And there's a lot of challenges we face here uh, domestically and abroad that we really need to work uh, together on. I, I really have belief that if there's two people in a room 
that agree on something, one of them doesn't need to be there, mm -hmm. honestly. I, I, I really, you know, we really need to really come forward, bring fresh ideas, challenge ideas. Don't be afraid to challenge ideas. Don't be afraid to bring forward new ideas and, you know, help, you know, move the organization, the community uh, into a different direction, into a, you know, direction moving forward. So uh, that's the, the one thing we really need, uh, I think. And let's get involved in your local groups and get involved in local organizations uh, and chapters as well. Can I add one other point? I also challenge everybody in the room to, to sure, commit to something that is meaningful to you, but also push yourself to care about something that means something to somebody else. Right? And, and talking about working in coalition, I mean, I think it, 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 it's important because it helps us to, to draw the connections between our issues and other people's issues. And so, so be sensitive and open to the fact that some other community is struggling in some way, right? It may not be immediately of concern to you, but have an open mind about it mm -hmm. so that you can have some conversation and dialogue about it and the expectation that when your issue is sort of the issue of the day, that other people will likewise feel some sensitivity and concern uh, and be able to support you on what you care about as well. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right, we gotta go. Uh, uh, real now, not no, now. no, no. Yeah. No, no, I, I told you. After All right, four. so, yeah, so yeah. we gotta, let's, if we can keep the questions short yes. and succinct, please. Uh, first of all, I thank the panel. Uh, my question was directed toward uh, Reggie for about immigration, but then I changed my mind. I said it's really for young lady standing here. I rather give her my oh. place. Oh, so and, good I, line. and I come last. I have no problem with that. Thank you. Thank you. My question is, um, why why is it police? They just look at people profiling like the Muslims, the uh, African Americans, all of them. Mm -hmm. why? why? Why are they engaged yeah, in profiling? Because they get they get they get they get incentives to do that, right? They're p picking on people who tend to be the least politically powerful in our society, um, and then really, frankly, historically, they've gotten money from the federal government to focus in on those communities. Mm -hmm. and and well, so um, I think um, there's a form of intimidation that the police rely on by, by doing this. And so and actually in, in the stop and frisk file that uh, we, we did, some testimony came out from Commissioner Kelly, a statement he made that uh, we're doing stop and frisk um, to uh, intimidate blacks and Latinos so they learn to, to fear being stopped. So um, the, if, if you're doing it not because of a genuine suspicion, and the Muslim surveillance program has nothing to do with genuine suspicion, it's pure blanket surveillance, stop and frisk doesn't turn on suspicion. It's actually a quota-driven policy to infiltrate the communities and intimidate them. Uh, it's a form of, of social control and intimidation by the police in I think a misguided, fundamentally misguided view in the long term that this is the way to decrease crime or, or combat radicalism in, in either of these categories. Mm -hmm. the, the cost is though is to these communities mm -hmm. and the communities need to say that's not acceptable. Yeah. I just, um, there should be no answer really to your question, the why part, because it's wrong. And the why is that we still live in a country where there's racism and people think that there is no racism, that we elected a black president, that means that everybody's fine and that if we can have a black president, that means our country's perfect and it's actually proved absolutely not. Um, and I think that uh, there is no reason why the police department should be targeting Muslims or Arabs or African Americans or Latinos. So there should be no answer, they should not be able to tell you why. Um, but what they do and their, the, the, the whys that they have um, are based on misinformation, based on lies, and based on a picture that these officers have been fed. So these officers in the police department are watching videos, like a video that you should watch on YouTube called The Third Jihad. There's a video on YouTube called The Third Jihad that basically is a Islam bashing propaganda video that was created by the Clarion Fund. And just to make a connection for you, the Clarion Fund in 2008 
sent out 27 million copies of this video called Obsession to put, instill fear in the American people so they won't vote for President Obama. That's the same fund that created this film called The Third Jihad that is being shown to police officers in New York City. And if you watch that video, and you can watch that video online, it's on YouTube, I don't like to give it hits, but it's, it gives some context. It basically, what it shows you is everything, every stereotype that you can think about the Muslim community. Carnages blowing up, you know, little kids with machine guns, and showing you pictures from like different parts of the Arab and Muslim world, you know, taking things out of context and editing and creating a video. Now, what do you expect a young, impressionable 22-year-old that just came out of the police academy, if all they've been trained is that these people are the enemy, these people are, are dangerous, these people are a threat to our country and our city. They implement the policies based on the perception that they had. It's like when women are in a black neighborhood and if you know, you're a white woman and you're snatching your you know, pocketbook every time you see a young black man. It's because something has been embedded in your mind, someone told you something, you saw something, you watched a movie, and that makes you do that. And that's exactly what the police department does, is it instills fear in their, uh, in, in, in their employees to do this, but it's also a policy, that's the problem. It's not just racist people, it's a, an, an actual policy that's across law enforcement agencies, so. Thank you. And Brainwashing, that's exactly you. what it is. Thank you for the question. We have time for two more, so. I'll be, uh, I'll be as quick as I can. First of all, thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. And um, a quick question for you is, how would you um, advise Mayor Bloomberg or the US government? You know, we want to keep the country safe. And their idea is we need to surveillance because we won't know um, the intentions of people if we don't surveillance. Uh, so how, wh wh what's an alternative? Thank you. There is, um there are alternatives already out there. Um, the alternatives are behavior-based policing. Policing based on leads. So you surveil, we're not saying don't spy on the Muslim community. If you believe, if the New York Pol Police Department has leads and believes that there's certain criminal activity coming out of individuals or a particular institution or mosque, by all means, surveil them, spy on them. Another alternative is community partnerships with communities. It, the police department believes that if we were to have a terrorist or a potential terrorist in our mosque, someone who was saying they were gonna commit acts of violence, they're basically saying we don't trust the community enough for them to come out to the police department and say we have someone in our mosque that's saying these violent things. And there is an, a really quick example that I'm gonna give you. Irvine, California, the Islamic Center calls up the FBI and says, Guess what? We found a guy for you. He's saying really violent things. He's, you know, you know, inciting people and saying really talking about jihad and all this stuff. Guess what happened? When the Islamic Center calls the FBI, they're like, "Crap, that's our guy that we sent in there." <laughs> Craig Montale, Craig Montale, and you could read on this. This is public. Craig Montale was an FBI informant that was sent into the Islamic Center in Irvine, who was supposed to come back and find somebody or incite and bring back information. He took it to the next level to the point where the Islamic Center called to report him to the FBI and he turned out to be one of them. But if you look at a lot of recent cases of quote unquote foil plots of terrorism in this country, most often it was our community that was calling law enforcement and bringing them in. So if our police department wants an alternative, start trusting communities, start seeing us as Americans and start seeing us as partners in counterterrorism in the United States of America. And stop targeting. And also, also there was the, the Unseers program the National Security Entry Exit Registration System, which was put in place after 9-11. Nearly 100,000 individuals were profiled at the airport. Zero terrorists, or zero suspects were found from it. What about the individuals in the schools and in the universities and the I agree. So the use of racial profiling is bad policing. It's counterproductive, right? It's communities who are profiled and surveilled aren't going to want to help. It's counterproductive. The other thing I would say is that you have to really, really strongly resist the notion of being safe versus respecting our, our privacy, right? It's not, they're, they're not either or. It's a false dichotomy. You can do them both. You really can protect us and respect our rights. Yes. And the, the Constitution kind of smarts that way. Um, <laughs> 
you know, it, 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 it incorporates this principle of, of justice and fairness, at least when properly applied, that you shouldn't um, uh, burden people's rights or, or, or harass or surveil them unless you have an adequate level of suspicion. And the, the higher the, the, the burden, the greater the level of suspicion. Um, and that happens to map really well with what's effective because suspicionless policing is preposterous. So take for I'll give two examples. The NYPD admitted in a deposition that it's, it's sur blanket surveillance program, it's mapping program of mu Muslims uh, resulted in quote, zero leads <laughs> in the stop and frisk uh, uh, um, practice. There were, it's done purportedly to search people for guns. Um, and in the four and a half million stops in um, over the past uh, eight years in New York, the statistician uh, ran the numbers, um, they uncovered 0.14% uh, guns, not 1.4% guns. 0.14% guns, um, and only 8% uh, of these encounters led to any summons or arrest. Um, right. You'd have better success, the expert testified, if you did a random checkpoint. It's terrible policing. And then the, the, the ultimate and sort of the long term, which gets your uh, uh, concern, is it alienates the communities you're, you're going to ultimately rely on. Oh, yeah. um, and so it's really, really nearsighted. And it's costly, and it's your money at work. Yeah. Um, Michelle with the last question. Okay, so I think my question is more on the community engagement than the legal side. Um, at our colleges and universities, I, are, I doubt that there are legal remedies, but what can we do about cases, for example, in which an organization like Campus Watch sends students to a professor's class to report on what they're saying about foreign policy, not to be there, be open-minded, and pass an exam, but to undermine this person's credibility and academic reputation. I think um, one of the things that we're very weak at in our community is defending those in our community who get slandered and marginalized, especially in academia. Um, and I think there are legal, there in some cases there may be legal remedies, but I don't think that those always work. It's very hard to prove um, slander and to prove that it's you know affected your life or damages around that. Um, but I think that you know me personally, I've been you can go online and just Google me and you'll, you'll speak for yourself, but um, I think we need to start standing up for those in our, in our, you know, our professors, um, even those who are not Arab and non-Muslim who speak the truth and say the right things. Um, make sure that um, when students in our group are being attacked, like in Brooklyn College, for, I'll give you a real quick example. In Brooklyn College just recently, there was an event around BDS and there was an uproar on Brooklyn College campus where they wanted the elected officials suddenly got involved and they wanted to do a counter event, that there has to be another side. Since when? Since when in college universities do we have to have the other side? Let the other side have their event some other time and they can, they can say, they can, you can bring the Ku Klux Klan to talk in your, in, your, in your student group, that's fine. We live in a country where there's freedom of speech. So these students, young SJP students for justice from Palestine, got attacked by the media as you know, anti-Israel, you know, anti-Semites, and de demoralize the whole young group of people who, who want to be activists. The thing that I'm most afraid about when it comes to the NYPD surveillance is the infringement on speech of our student population on campus. Because if you look at any other movement, <laughs> the core activism and the beginnings of civil rights movements in multiple communities, whether it's the women's rights community, uh, civil rights, um, LGBTQ is on our college campuses. And if our kids are silenced on college campuses and are afraid to talk about Palestine, to talk about issues affecting them, our community is, we're done. We, should, we, we don't have a future here. So I think the idea here is courage. Gotta, you gotta be courageous, you gotta be brave. Um, and I think our parents are very important in this discussion. Stop telling your kids to be careful. Stop telling your kids not to talk about BDS or talk about Palestine. Stop telling your kids that, don't worry, someone else is gonna take care of this. You, I want you to be a lawyer and a doctor. Don't mess your future up. Because that's what Arab parents do all the time. I hear it all the time. So let's encourage our kids to speak truth to power. Let's encourage them, let's motivate them. And when they come and invite you to an event about Palestine and to commemorate the Nakba, you should be the front one, first person in that front row encouraging and supporting your children. And I just have a, uh, before we close, I wanna call R Renee, um, Aliyah uh, and Nicole, 
Um, if you guys could just please, you know, stand up, and, and I just want to do a quick introduction, uh, just about uh, of the ADC uh, legal department. Uh, Nicole Salim joined ADC uh, a little over a year ago, uh, from uh, I believe Iowa, University, Iowa Law School, correct? And uh, Aya is with us, uh, been with us for a couple of years now, uh, legal fellow, um, and she's uh, based from the Michigan office, and. Uh, Renee Marad, uh, also a staff attorney from uh, Oklahoma, uh, joined us uh, about a year ago as well. And these are, are three very uh, dedicated, hardworking individuals. So please <laughs> give them a round of applause. They they put in their they, they put in their hours. They put in their their time. And and in in the NGO world and the nonprofit world, um, it, it does take dedication and heart. And of course, we wouldn't be able to do the work we do at ADC. Uh, you know, without having these three uh, wonderful staff members. Um, with that being said, we got to move uh, into our closing. Um, right after this session, we do have a, a question and answer session of form with some government agencies, so we'll probably flow uh, right into that conversation. You guys are more than welcome uh, to stick around if you have some tough questions to ask as well. So uh, let's just uh, do some closing remarks and uh, move on. So um, <laughs> I feel like we've really already yeah, said it all. Yeah, so, yeah. But thank you for supporting us. It really does start with you. Stay engaged, stay involved, stay concerned about issues beyond your own communities. Same. Thank you, um, everybody, for being here. This is the first step because not every Arab in the country is here. So that means that you already made some sort of commitment to come and learn and be a part of this. So I thank you for that. Um, and stay connected and um, start organizing or continue organizing for those that already do. Uh, yeah, all, all the same, I'll sort of repeat um, a motto of CCR was incorporated from Frederick Douglass, uh, a, a former slave abolitionist um, and uh, 19th century activist and real hero who said, uh, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll take a five minute break. And then meet right back in here for the um, uh, the session with the government agencies. Thank you. Hello, I'm Mo. How are you? Hi. 